Oh, yeah, we don't need perfect credit, uh uh-huh. Even with credit scores in the 500s, it only takes a cup of coffee to get started. Dig it? Oh, yeah, snap into it. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm pretty good, Tony. Pretty good. I'm glad to be home in Florida. And uh, a lot of travel last week or so. Yesterday, coast to coast, San Diego to Jacksonville, border to border. So I'm, uh, I'm, st- I'm still trying to pull myself together. I've been doing that for years, so it's <laughs> we'll be all right. We'll be all right. I feel good. Feel good. Looking forward to talking to you and all of our fans and friends. Interesting show today. So oh, yeah, all good, man. man. Well, listen, I had a lot of fun talking about Brian Pillman with you. And of course, last week we did a, a best of played some of your old tapes from the old radio show back in the day, because you were still on the left coast, but now yeah. we're back in the saddle. And we're going to be talking about King of the Ring 1993. But before we do, we should mention that uh, as folks are listening to this, next weekend is the debut of AEW Collision. The announcement has been made that not only is the show starting on June 17th from the United Center in Chicago, but will also feature the return of CM Punk. How excited are you, man? Another show for AEW and CM Punk is back. This has uh, got to be good news for all elite wrestling. I think it's good news for all elite wrestling. It's uh, more exposure, a chance to shine, a chance to get a lot of people more exposure. So, uh, I think it's a good move and, uh, you know, Saturday night's challenging. There's nobody can deny that it's always been challenging for various programming. So, you know, we'll see how it works out. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. It's going to do really well. I hope I'm on it. No, I don't know who the announcers are going to be yet, but nonetheless, uh, we'll find out soon enough. Well, I can't wait. I'm excited that, uh, AEW's business seems to be a booming with a new show. And of course with, uh, CM Punk coming back, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of chatter. And, uh, as folks are listening to this, this past weekend, AEW was in Huntsville and they're going to be continuing these house rules events in a market near you. Be sure to pick up tickets for collision or some of these non televised live events in your area at AEWTIX.com. That's AEWTIX.com. But Jim, today's topic is King of the Ring 1993. I can't believe it's June already here in 2023. And I can't believe that this show we're discussing was 30 years ago. My goodness, where does the time go? No kidding. That's right, isn't it? Uh, I, it, it, it does seem like it was just like yesterday or something like that. But uh, I remember it very well. So it's pretty cool. It's the first pay per view I did. Uh, after WrestleMania nine and it was, uh, oh heck, I don't know. It, it, uh, it, it's always going to be special and it, it happened to also be the last pay-per-view I did because Vince came back to his seat. Uh, so, you know, but interesting times, you just part of the journey, man, just part of the journey. And I was glad to be along for the ride. Well, that ride really started for you with your debut at WrestleMania nine. And, um, at that pay-per-view, we would see Hulk Hogan become the five-time WWF champion, defeating Yoko Zuna in about 20 seconds, right after Yoko had just defeated Bret Hart for the belt. And Hogan's going to be defending the title against Yoko here at the first ever King of the Ring pay-per-view. Now, of course, there had been a few King of the Rings before, but they were more live events. But now you get to tune in and see it on pay-per-view. And it turns out this title defense after winning it at uh, WrestleMania is going to be Hogan's only title defense during this run. I'm sure part of you had to be interested, but I mean, maybe I don't want to put words in your mouth. Let me just ask you grew up and cut your teeth with mid South. And then of course the NWA, a little bit of time with WCW, but during all of that run from say the mid eighties on, Man, Hulk Hogan was the biggest star and it wasn't even really close, you know, domestically or even internationally. Hogan was the, the top dog in the entire industry, but you had never really worked with him, right? No, not really. I had not, uh, it was an interesting experience because, you know, he had to be tended to, uh, he had needs and that happens when you get a big star like that. That's so dominant. 
uh, it was a interesting experience to say the least. He spent a lot of time with Vince during that time to work out a finish, which I didn't understand why that took so long, but nonetheless, I guess it's just part of the routine. I don't know. Maybe it made hope feel better if it did cool. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a interesting day to see how business was transacted behind the scenes. And, uh, and we got ready for this pay-per-view, the main event of the pay-per-view. Were you, uh, disappointed or surprised to learn the nature of the relationship with Hulk Hogan and the company, because this show we're going to cover while it's not technically his last piece of business with the company, it is going to be his last televised match. And it feels like, man, you're just really getting there. And this is supposed to be the top star in the business. It almost feels like you guys are ships in the night. He's on his yeah. way out and you're on your way in. Did you know he's on his way out? I kind of had a feeling. I, I, I felt that he wasn't comfortable and that might've just been cause he just burned out tired, uh, or wasn't completely satisfied with his surroundings and the talents therein. So, uh, it was interesting. It was an interesting uh, time. You know, I was just, after I heard all the stories, what we're going to do, what we're not going to do. I was just really happy that we did something and got the show on the road. So, uh, it was an interesting finish. A lot of, a lot of wild West in that finish, you know, it was just a little different piece of the photographer thing and all that stuff. It was just a unique, uh, unique arrangement to get into the main event and the, and the finish thereof. Well, before we talk about the actual event itself, let's talk a little bit about what your experience has been like with the company. We mentioned that your first announcing duties, your official debut is WrestleMania nine at Caesars palace, but a week after WrestleMania, you debut on the wrestling challenge syndicated program. You'll be right. replacing gorilla monsoon to work with Bobby Heenan and really gorilla and Bobby had been on screen together for the better part of the last seven years. Was this events call to split up this duo or did monsoon have some health issues or what's the thinking here? Well, I think it was Vince's call. No doubt about that. Uh, I didn't ask to replace monsoon, my, one of my heroes, one of my best friends, uh, but his health was waning. His health was not as, he wasn't as strong. He wasn't as resilient as he once was. So the decision was made to put me with Heenan. And for me as just individually, it was a dream come true because, you know, I always thought that Heenan, especially in that era was as good as there was. And maybe as good as there ever, ever was. So, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a fun journey. There we are. That's a nice, <laughs> that's a nice picture. I, you know, it's funny. We go back and look at these and look at them on YouTube and so forth. All these pictures, I, I, some weird r reason. I remember the ties I'm wearing <laughs> or Jan bought that tie or she brought this home for me to wear or whatever. So, uh, but I enjoyed working with Bobby. He was just a blast. He was never dull, man. Never a dull moment. Sometimes he was in a great mood and we sailed through the voiceovers and sometimes he just didn't feel like performing and, uh, but I don't know how good he felt either. He wasn't no young chicken. Right. So, so I, I had a lot of fun with Bobby and I love Bobby this very day. And he was, there's just nobody like him. Nobody, nobody like him. Closest person like Bobby Heenan was Jerry Lawler where he could do a lot of things really well. And, uh, Lawler and, and, uh, and Heenan had that in common. They could do anything very well. Well, let's mention that, uh, challenge is essentially like the C show at the time it's behind superstars and the recently debuted Monday night raw and Vince himself is hosting the two main shows of superstars and Monday night raw. Were you disappointed that you didn't, you weren't immediately figured into one of those shows or are you just happy to have a Jersey here? I was happy to have a Jersey. Yeah, I, I was fine with it. I didn't have any ego issues. I should be doing superstars or I should be on raw or whatever. I just knew those opportunities would present themselves. Uh, if I worked hard, did good work and, uh, was patient. So that's kind of my philosophy of that thing. I just, I, I went right along with it and everything seemed to be good. I enjoyed that, that time in my career. I enjoyed working with Bobby and the crew enjoyed working. So they, they would do voiceovers on, I think Tuesday for, uh, uh, Heenan, or excuse me, uh, Vince and his crew. And then Heenan and I would come in on, uh, uh, the next day on Wednesday and do three one hour shows. And, uh, 
the, the, the television crew seemed to really enjoy it because we didn't demand what the catering was. Uh, Vince had a, you know, his catering was different than Heenan and mine. You know, we had, we had things that had mayonnaise in it, like tuna salad, chicken salad or whatever. So it was a, a different mood and the crew liked it because they liked our food and catering and we didn't, we didn't demand any food. We just took where it was there. Uh, we didn't create a menu, but it was just a, a fun thing, man. It was just fun to be there, see the crew. They were glad to see us. You know, we got through the voiceovers in about half the time that, uh, uh, Vince and Savage did because Vince is always having to stop and take phone calls and he's running a company. So it would, you know, he would get started and then he has to stop and take a phone call or make a phone call or whatever. So, uh, I, I thought, uh, I thought it was a fun, fun gig. You know, I, I working with Heenan is a, a joy, right? It's amazing how, how smart he was, how sharp he was. So it's cool for me. I, I'm still a wrestling fan, Conrad. And so that, that made it all that much easier for me. What were your first experiences like working in the WWF studios in Stanford? Uh, they were very organized and they, they had a schedule. They knew how to tell time. I thought that was really cool. That's not always the case in pro wrestling. So, uh, but they they were timely and they were organized and, uh, and we had a great TV studio crew. It just made the job a lot easier. Audio, no audio issues, no video issues. It was just, we were in the studio. So we had, we could, whatever was maybe malfunctioning could be, uh, addressed quickly and, and, pro, and pro, promptly and, and accurately. So it was good. It was good. I, I had a, I had a blast doing that show. Besides the live pay-per-view broadcast, like the one we're going to talk about here today, a lot of the on-screen camera work that you're going to see on like challenge or superstars, that seems to have all been done in post-production in the studio for Stanford. Right. And they're going to, I guess, use, you know, the old school green screens. Yeah. And they're going to try to make it look like you're actually in the arena announcing. This is probably a little different from what your experience had been like so far in wrestling. Did you like that? Or was that something that was a challenge to get used to? Well, I had to get used to it. I had to get used to it, but it wasn't hard to pull off once you understood the concept. Uh, and the crew again, made it easy. You know, we saw on the monitor, what you, the fans at home were saying, and that green screen was, uh, housed the audience or the wrestlers entering the ring, but it, uh, they did a soil job of making sure that, the that whole process looked real and, and authentic. So, uh, it was good. It was good. I, I needed to learn that. I needed to learn that concept. I need to learn how to do that like any other announcer. And we had not done that much. It, it, the, pro, the production in WCW was not as refined, not as organized. Uh, and so we, we found that organization and, and, uh, in, in this, in this format. And we just bl bust through that thing, man. It was just super, super. I had a lot of fun. Can you talk us through a, a typical day of working those voiceover sessions in studio with Bobby and gorilla? I mean, is that, is that an all day thing? Is it something that you can knock out? I mean, you mentioned earlier that sometimes there were days where it didn't feel like your dance partner was in the mood to work, but what was that typical process? Like is someone producing you and saying, oh, now let's try it again, but say it like this or what, what's that look like? Yeah, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, not, but not overboard, uh, for sure. Uh, and we would have somebody in our ear, but it wasn't Vince. It wasn't aggressive and it wasn't, uh, in, in, you know, uh, an, an interruption every few minutes. It wasn't that like that because Vince wasn't even there. Right. So, uh, but we had our notes and I was organized and, and, and those matches are not hard to call them. And, you know, you got a real common goal. You got somebody's going to go over that you're pushing. And so you just got to saddle the right horse and, and, and help get them over with uh, positive accolades and things of that nature. So it wasn't, it wasn't hard that, you know, the concept is to get talent over. And that's what we did. And it was a job, uh, preliminary job infused production. We knew who was being featured and what we needed to say in general, but not verbatim. 
uh, but you know, having he he had done these shows forever. I'd done these shows forever. I did a lot of these shows like this in WCW, but not as smooth, not as organized. So this was a it was a fun thing. You can't work with Bobby Heenan and not have a good time. Right, that's right. Sometimes he was didn't feel well, and I had patience, and we had uh, chocolate cake. So when Bobby was in a bad mood, or he didn't feel good health wise, or travel was bad, or something was up, because he was kind of in a quasi transition period here. He was, you know, he was thinking about making a move uh, that he he openly talked to me about uh, because he was just, I think he was just burned out. Same crew, same routine, same everything. So he was, uh, he was, uh, could be challenging to work with not hard to work with but challenging because sometimes his mind just wasn't on, his, on the project <laughs> but bobby heenan at half speed is better than just about anybody I ever worked with so uh but he did fine we well, that's that famous chocolate cake thing you know we go out and smoke a joint and calm him down and in my car ride around stanford and that was all exciting and then come back and and do our work and eat you can imagine had the munchies, so we we did fine. <laughs> it was a fun thing. We're like little kids, junior high kids, slipping away and smoking a joint. Did you still, I mean, we know that you're going to be doing some voiceover for matches with Gorilla Monsoon on stuff like Coliseum Home Video and All American Wrestling, which was another syndicated show. But are you also having to attend these marathon t- television taping sessions that would happen? So when they went to some town and actually ran you know, four or six weeks worth of shows and filmed it. Are you attending that live event as well? Or just mostly studio stuff? A lot of them I did attend, uh, just to familiarize myself with the product, uh, in case I was needed there to do an interview or something that was added in late. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, I tried to make those tapings. I needed to learn the product. I needed to learn the talent. I need to learn the personnel. And, uh, so it made sense to go to those tapings. It was another day on the road, but it wasn't a bad day. Uh, cause like I said, we did most of our on cameras, actually all of our on cameras and our, our the voiceovers back in the studio. So it was in a more controlled environment. So it was, uh, no, I think I felt obligated to be at those tapings. I, mean, I didn't do a lot cause they were done back in the studio, but it helped me get familiar with the system and the people and so forth and to master that skill set of doing voiceovers the way we did and doing the green screens and all that stuff. You had to be particular what you wore and things of that nature, but nothing that couldn't be addressed and handled. And, uh, and uh, there's always a solution there. Let's, uh, let's talk about just the difference of the way of life. I believe you, you lived in Atlanta when you worked for WCW. Now you're going to be living in Stanford. Is this, how hard is it to get adjusted to just, living and, and functioning outside of work, just being a citizen of Connecticut. Well, it was a little different. Yeah. A little different, a little different climate, a little different, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the mood was different. Uh, you know, I, I, it's just part of the, part of the journey to me. And I had kind of stayed in Atlanta long enough. Uh, and I probably still would have been there, but the decisions were made that I wasn't needed, which is cool. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Some people ask me, were you mad at Eric Bischoff for what he did to you at WCW? Hell no. Cause that was a, that was a, one of the best things that ever happened to me. It got me to WWE. Let me compete on that level, uh, and see where it takes us. And it took us on a pretty good journey. I'm curious from your, uh, recollection, you know, you're, you're going to show up here for the WWE and, and you're quite a veteran. I mean, you've been in this game for a long time. And we've covered some of your start in the uh, business uh, several episodes ago when we called it the dark side of Mid-South. But I'm curious, are, are other announcers, office people, some of the younger talent, even some veteran talent, does anyone come and say, what do you think about this? Or what would you do? Are they seeking your advice and counsel? Or are you still kind of the new guy? At least I'm the new guy. Okay. And I, sh- I kept my, believe it or not, it's be hard for you to believe. And and a lot of my other friends, I kept my mouth shut. Okay. I listened and, and eased into this role. Uh, 
and it worked out. It just, it just worked out. Sometimes you, you learn a lot when you keep your mouth shut. We don't all have to be talking all the time. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I looked at it totally as a learning experience. Uh, I followed Heenan's lead on a lot of things uh, and Monsoon's. Monsoon was the most logical, pragmatic guy that I ever worked with in wrestling. And he, 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 I loved him and he loved me and, and he didn't like how I was treated more often than not. And, uh, which I deeply respect because he took a stand and, you know, I was just that Southern guy, Jr. the Southern guy. He's a, one of those, uh, redneck guys. That's what he even called me on the air. Redneck. That was before Steve Austin got that title. So, uh, you know, I, I had a, I had a. I don't, I can't think of any bad experiences. I, mean, I had to learn a new system, right? If you're a ball player and you're getting to a new offense, you got to learn the offense, so to speak. And that's what I did. I applied myself to learning new skills, a new skill set in a new game plan, new environment. And, uh, I think it made me a better announcer over the long haul. I want to do a little bit of a sidebar here for a minute, because I've heard other guys who were you know, territory guys, they grew up, you know, in the, they cut their teeth in mid Atlantic or mid South or what have you. And I would hear them talk about the presentation, the vision of Vince McMahon's WWF. And they would almost talk about it in, uh, in a disdainful way. Oh, that's that cartoony stuff, you know? And so the, the perception was certainly, you know, we don't do what they do. We're, we're more, whatever this means, quote unquote, real wrestling. Yeah. That's for the kids, all that sort of thing. Yeah. And I could see how a lot of people would say that when they're outside of the tent, because they're trying to justify why perhaps that has a more higher profile opportunity than what their current home promotion does. Now at this point though, most of the territories, in fact, all the territories are gone. It's essentially a two horse race. Now it's WCW and the WWF. And now you've left maybe you're not the best terms with WCW. Did you feel like, Hey, I got to try to make this different cartoony style work, or is it a function of, Hey man, no matter what I was trying to sell myself, this is the big time. Or is it more of a, you know, if I really want to make this wrestling thing work, I got to make it work here. Cause I yeah. may have burned a bridge there. Is it a combination of all three? No, uh, I don't know. I knew that I needed to tweak my game. Uh, it was a, again, a, a different world. Uh, it was, uh, highly organized and, uh, I had not been used to that, which was good. So when you say you're going to start at 10 o'clock, that's what time that you're going to roll tape. So you need to be there earlier to get ready, make up wardrobe, uh, go over your, go over your open Bobby and I would only go over our open. So we could get what he was going to say. I fit in. Right. And I knew he was the star of the team. So I fit in, in my little role. Uh, and it worked out, it worked out fine. Quite frankly, it worked out real well. So, uh, but I, I don't, I, I, I knew I had to change a little bit of my direction. Uh, the style there was more entertainment based. Yes. Uh, and it was less athletic based. I had prefer, I would prefer the athletic base. And eventually when we got into the attitude era, that fit my style perfectly, but it took a while to get there because I wasn't on raw for a long time. And, uh, but it worked out, it worked out. It's, you know, sometimes in life, things are just meant to be, if you stick with them, mm -hmm. don't, don't, don't turn your Jersey in. Don't, don't, don't walk, don't go sit on the sideline. No, I don't want to wear a clipboard, a, a visor. And I carry a clipboard around like a backup quarterback. I want to play. I'm that way today. And, uh, so that's how I approach my job in my career is I want to get in the game. Cause I felt like if I got in the game and it was allowed to do a little bit of me that eventually it would all work out fine. You know, he and I were a hell of a team, uh, really were, I wish I'd got to work with him longer, but he had already decided. Uh, back in that period of time that he was pretty much done. He wanted more money. He wanted less hours. 
uh, he wanted to change. And he, like I said, he wasn't a young kid. He knew what he wanted. He knew why he wanted it. And so eventually, uh, he got what he wanted, you know, Vince, uh, just let him go or let him leave. I think better. He didn't fire him. He's letting him leave because that Bobby wanted to leave. Same thing with me and Gene. You know, I loved him too. He was a great friend. I miss him every day. Him and Bobby, both. They're two icons in the wrestling business that I got to set under their learning tree and help me, uh, advance my game. So, uh, I look at that whole time as a learning experience, a fun time. Like I said earlier, you can't work with Bobby Heenan and or Monsoon and get to know them and not have a good time. They're just that kind of guys. Are they the kind of guys you want to go on long car trips with? Are they the kind of guys you want to go to lunch with? Are they the kind of guys you want to go have a little chocolate cake? Well, nothing wrong with a little chocolate cake. Let's talk about your, uh, your first television taping you're going to do with the first matches you're going to call. It's a wrestling challenge broadcast. Your very first one you did it alongside Bobby, the brain Heenan. Yeah. So besides your WrestleMania nine debut, this would be the first time we would see you on a WWF broadcast. The show aired on April 11th, 1993. Uh, the matches were actually taped over a month earlier, March 9th in Augusta, Georgia, and it shook out like this. Rick and Scott Steiner defeated the executioners of Barry Hardy and Dwayne Gill. Bam Bam Bigelow would pin Reno Riggins. Tatanka would pin Glenn Ruth, who we know eventually is going to become headbanger Mosh. Mr. Hughes would pin JD Stryker. Uh, Tiger Jackson, who had the Bushwhackers along with him, would pin Little Louie who had the Beverly brothers with him. Terrific. Terry Taylor would pin Joey Maggs and Jim Duggan would pin Barry Hardy. He's pulling double duty here. A lot of these guys though, you're familiar with uh, yeah. Steiner brothers, Bam Bam, Duggan, Mr. Hughes, Terry Taylor. So there's some familiar faces running around here in Titan land. Sure was, uh, that really never was an issue to me. I, my, my, uh, challenge no pun intended was to call what was in the monitor. What was the image that we were, were being fed into our monitors. It's the same image that the audience is seeing at home. And so understand your, your what, what you're there for. You're there to get talent over. You're there to give the underneath guys, uh, uh Glenn Roos of the world, uh, an opportunity to have something good said about them so that when they do their, their job, their honors, uh, they, you know, get, they do their business that, uh, we've made them have more value so that the value, their value increased when, uh, uh, when they lost. So the loss was more significant for the guy going over. It's not a hard concept. You know, who's going to get the most push. Who's going to get the most accolades. And, uh, so that was, that was the, the, the mission never changed. It's the same thing I did for cowboy. Same thing I did on WCW when you had enhancement like matches. Uh, that's kind of where we were. So, um, it, it worked out for me real well. And, and knowing those guys was good before the taping started. It was, you know, you can set and shoot the breeze and talk and, and uh, laugh and, and find out kind of what's in their mind and what they wanted to try. Then maybe they had something they were going to try that was different. They wanted you to be aware of so you could document it. So it was a great experience. It's a great experience for me. And I'm glad I got that opportunity because it may, like I said, Conrad, it made me a better announcer because I'm not calling a stem wander every match or every night or challenge was, uh, the enhancement show superstars that Vince was on. I think he was on savage a lot and whoever else, uh, that's the show that had more angles, uh, things of that nature. So it's just a little different role, but if you understand the business and you've been in it as long as I have, hell, I was in the business 20 years before I got to WWE, right? So I kind of understood the, the, the gist of things. So it was a, it was good. Just a different, it's just a different team, different league, different way of doing things. And I, I probably needed that change quite frankly. Bruce has said that Vince loved the fact that you would call the action with sprinkles of story. And then later it was part of the reason Vince didn't like what you were doing. Did you, <laughs> how quickly did you feel like you were at times getting 
mixed messages about what the old man wanted. early on, early on. Yeah. He wanted somebody else out there. He didn't want a Southern fat boy. And, uh, that's what he got. He hired that he, guy. He had buyer's remorse. Maybe he thought it was I think so. a clue to take somebody from WCW, but then once he got you, it's like, well, this isn't really what I had in mind. Yeah. I think, I think kind of along that, 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 uh, that street, I think so. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, I knew early on when, when the boss quits talking to you or speaking to you, you know, that something has changed. Yeah. And, and he, like you said, maybe he thought he bought a pig and a poke. I'm not sure. But, uh, in any event, I knew things were, there was something up, which eventually led soon thereafter to my, uh, getting my notice, not even being told why. I don't know. I did everything I was asked to do, but apparently it wasn't good enough. And I just kept trying to fight through it. Have you had that happen, uh, in other times in your career where it feels like the boss doesn't talk to you anymore? Was, was there a falling out like that with Bill Watts or in WCW no. or some other time? Not with Bill. I don't know if anybody really did that in WCW. I had a pretty good solid spot there more often than not. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I think it was just a, it was just a, uh, he got, sometimes Vince got tired of seeing people. Right. I remember, I remember, uh, John Gaborik, friend of Kevin Dunn's, his nickname is big, big guy played center at Towson state in football, uh, nice guy and a smart guy. And I think he's back working for him now on those, some of the international projects they do. Uh, but you know, somebody said. Vince just got tired of looking at it and, you know, uh, John Gabor's a big guy, kind of heavy set like me, maybe a little bit bigger. And that didn't bode well with the old man. It should have any impact on it. What, what do you care? How much a guy weighs that is behind the scenes all the time. Now, there's an exception. The real world big was on TV a few times, but when he had to go to Vince's office, the word on the street was Vince got tired of looking at a big, heavy, fat guy. Which didn't give me much encouragement because I was a big, fat, heavy, heavy guy too. <laughs> so you know, but hey, you gotta, you gotta be a, a um, you gotta be a meaning. I don't know where I look, you gotta, you gotta be pliable. You gotta, you gotta figure out, you know, what where you can go, where you can't go, and and. But I knew that uh, something was up. I didn't know I was going to get released because it came without warning. I remember that meeting very well too. So, but look, it didn't kill me. I'm still here. I'm still talking and I'm still working. So it must not have been the end of the world. It worked out a week after out. WrestleMania nine, you go right over to Sheffield, England, where you and Bobby are going to announce the UK rampage 93 television special for sky sports. Is this your first time in England? I think it, no, uh, hold on. No, I went there with WWE. Uh, I was there with, uh, Mark Marrow, PN news and myself on a PR trip. Okay. And we, I, I remember we were in Dublin on St. Patrick's day. I got you. Which was kind of wild. Uh, so, uh, so I've been there before, but not a lot. So it was a new experience. Uh, Lord Alfred Hayes, Bobby Heenan and myself, we're the only three guys in first class on the flight over the Atlantic. And, uh, there was a lot of alcohol consumed on that flight a lot, but it was fun. You know, Lord Alfred's a very funny. Once he got over being mad at me for taking Monsoon's place, Alfred was a good friend. Yeah. You know, let's I mean, talk about that because you wrote in your book that Alfred was unprofessional and rude to you until gorilla and Bobby stepped in. Yeah. But man, Tony Schiavone just talked so lovingly about Lord Alfred Hayes. Is that really what it was rooted in? He felt like you had replaced gorilla and he wasn't happy about it. Yeah, of course I didn't make it up as if that was your call, right? It wasn't my call. Right. And, and gorilla had his health issues. His strength was waning. Uh, so, uh, but at, at, at the end of the day, when, when Alfred and I began to communicate, everything ended greatly. He was the same guy that Shivani describes. Uh, but Shivani knew, or, or Alfred knew that Shivani was, wasn't there to take anybody's spot. He's there. To, he's a new voice, new announcer. 
So, uh, but it worked out fine. And at the end of the day, Alfred and I are good friends. I'm happy for that. I'm, I'm, I feel blessed that, you know, he, he's a character, funny, liked his wine, liked his young women. He was just a character to say the least. So I, I, uh, I'm glad that we, I got to work with him quite frankly, it didn't start off well, but we kept communicating. And as long as we kept communicating, well, there's, a, there's hope. Same thing in your relationships, kids. If you continue to communicate with, with your significant other or friend or whatever it may be, you got a damn good chance of making this thing work. If you stop communicating, your chances of making it work are slim and none. And good old slim, just leave in town. <laughs> I love that. In your book, you talked a little bit about booking talent for the in-studio promos they have to do in Stanford to promote these different house shows. Great pain in the ass. A magnificent pain in the ass. Everybody either thought they were getting like Randy Savage cornered me one day and almost wanted to fight because he thought I was taking advantage of his time when it was orders from headquarters that we want to use Savage more. Uh, that was Vince's deal, but he didn't tell Randy. So Randy found out he was doing some promos for Marcus that didn't even have live events, but I was under the orders of the, of the chairman. Uh, but Savage had a screw loose anyway, very talented. Very, very talented, uh, very unique, but he, uh, he was very, he was very, I don't say weak. He was insecure as hell. Right. And I don't know what Bruce says about him. You know, him and Bruce are better buddies than me. Paranoid. Yeah. He was that way. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, but, uh, but the, the crew there, I mean, Monsoon and, and Lord Alfred, look, all these veterans, these all the fame guys. Damn, if I can't learn something from those dudes, I'm not trying very hard. And, and I thought I learned a lot from those fellas. Always got great stories, great background, interesting suggestions and so forth. So I just want to fit into the family there. I want to fit into the team. I want to earn my stripes, earn my jersey, if you will, and, and move forward in a positive way. Then that, we got back to Sheffield. That was a good trip. It was a live show. I remember Linda McMahon was there when we were doing our, uh, on camera rehearsals at the open and I slipped up and said, WCW and, uh, at, everybody made a bigger deal out of that than it was, uh, but they're having fun at my, my expense. So, uh, but it was fun, man. That was a big, the arena was like 10,000, eight or 10,000 It's full, uh, good card. Kind of like, it was kind of like doing a clash. That's what I equated it to big card, live audience, etc. So I'm, I'm glad I got that one in, under, my, under my belt before, uh, I got turned loose because it was a fun experience, fun trip and fun experience. I want to ask you about Jerry Lawler. He's already working with the company by the time you get there. I think he started back in December of 92, but you guys don't actually get paired together until like July of 94. When you're stepping in to cover for Vince during the steroid trial, right. did you get to spend much time with Lawler in your early tenure? 93, were you spending any time with him? Uh, ample amount, but not like, like it eventually worked into. Right. Uh, you know, but you know, he, he still stayed in Memphis. He'd fly in the day of voiceovers oftentimes more often than not. So he just got into town, come to the studio, knock out our business and so forth. Uh, but I knew I, you know, I'd already met, I knew Jerry, I knew of him and I knew him, you know, there's that tape out floating around where he came to mid South with Jerry and Jared on a, uh, talent exchange to work with cowboy and get some new talent. We got the rock and roll express cowboy made the midnight express a team, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so Jerry went around a lot, but uh, you know, he was easy to talk to. He's just, we were two piece. Out, out of the same pod, two country boys like fried food and, and wrestling. And, uh, so it was good. You know, he, I, when I would ride with him, he always drove. I I've been blessed in that regard where I didn't have to drive everywhere. And Lawler was a driver and he also controlled the radio, uh, oldies, you know, I, for some reason, every time I hear a Herman's hermit song, I think a Lawler sitting behind the wheel singing the lyrics. To Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely daughter. 
And so he was a singer too. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. A lot of fun. It was just a match made in heaven. Could not have been more perfect. And I, I, I think about him every day cause he's still battling his health issues. And, and, you know, we all want Jerry to get better and get well and get back out there. Uh, you know, I, I got an appearance coming up, uh, some several appearances. And I, I know that when he gets healthy, we'll be making several appearances together, which would be a nice little package for the fans. Hell yeah. So listen, the radio WWF gig comes later in the summer of 93. Uh, was that part of the original deal when you came over? We all know, and we've heard a lot of your classic episodes when you were covering WCW down in Atlanta. Was that something that Vince saw value in and yeah. it was just a matter of laying the groundwork? Yeah, he liked the idea. It's just a natural progression. You know, he's got this video thing going with the television and, uh, you know, we just kind of followed the trend. Talk radio was getting bigger and bigger. We just didn't have the staff for it, uh, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, it was something he and I talked about, uh, in, in that long marathon meeting we had in Augusta, Georgia, that actually got me hired. So I'm glad he did because, uh, somebody punched it off four of my tires while I was in there in the meeting. Goodness. Yeah. That wasn't, a, I was uh, stuck in Augusta with four flat tires. I don't know who did it. I probably don't want to know, but it wasn't funny. It wasn't a good rib. When you do a rib, you damage somebody's personal property. It's not a good rib. Not good. Uh, so I had to figure out how to get the hell back to Atlanta from Augusta with four flat tires. I found a place that sold used tires. They're open all night. A cop uh, or two helped me out, make, you know, with the communication, getting people back and forth. Uh, but it was, I got home like, you know, seven or eight o'clock in the morning. My goodness. It, it made me think, are you sure you're doing the right thing? Right. Cause I could have stayed at WCW just in a different role. And I, th I almost did. I thought about it. I love living in Atlanta. I love this, the culture, the people, the city. It's all great, but you know, you got to make changes and sacrifices in, in your life. If you're going to maintain your upward mobility, uh, and on your, on your work, in your workplace. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was unique. Uh, that time was very unique. And I was going and that, but he, Vince paid me so much money. Uh, his first offer was I took the first offer because it was a lot of money uh, for me, uh, you know, six figure plus and, you know, uh, he moved my stuff. And that's that famous story. He got, I told the story about, uh, WCW, uh, holding my refrigerator and my washer dryer hostage. <laughs> I he still ain't seen those damn appliances. Uh, there's some place. So, but anyway, it was, it was good. It was good in that respect. I needed to change. I needed to get more accountability in my life. I needed to keep moving forward. And I wasn't sure I was going to move forward in WCW based on the infrastructure that was in place. Now, Eric did a nice job of getting the infrastructure back, uh, to a manageable level and so forth. But, uh, it was, uh, it was time to move on. It was time to move on. So me going to WWF was a blessing, even though it was rough sledding in less than a year, I was already out. I had had no arguments with anybody. I had no, no issues. It's just that he got tired of hearing me or seeing me. And, uh, I remember he bringing me into the office and with Lisa Wolf, who was the, uh, HR lady, mm -hmm. she was scary. And, uh, you know, all the while Vince is letting me go. She's trying to make it better. You know, I want to say, Hey, look, I'm fucking getting fired. How better, how, how can it be better? Now, we'll get you counseling. I don't need any counseling. I need a job. So, uh, I, uh, but the, the, my break came in the steroid trial. It's funny that the, all the announcers that Vince kept, he did not want in his chair on Monday night raw. That was my deal. So he must not have lost all the confidence in me. There was just something else that, that was, you know, was, was going on. I don't, I don't really know, you know, Bruce would be better to explain that to you. Cause he and Pat were joined at the hip of the old man. So he may know more about the backstory of that. And I'm sure it'll be, well, Jr. said this and we couldn't keep him happy or whatever. Oh, whatever. Create your own story. I don't give a shit. Uh, I know I was working hard. I was on time and I was a good employee 
and I thought I did a pretty decent job on the air. And apparently at the end of the day, so did he, so did he meaning Vince pronoun boy. So, uh, and you just gotta suck it up and go and, uh, not quit, not stop. And so that's, I saw that little shot on raw as an opportunity and the ratings came up. So it was just a different presentation, different sound. And, uh, so I'm glad I got that, that opportunity because it really opened the doors for later on, on raw. Vince saw I could handle a, a big load there. I could, I could take care of myself there in that, in that environment because working with Savage is not, it was not easy. It really wasn't, uh, again, he's paranoid all the time. He didn't trust anybody. You know, why'd you say that? What'd you say? what do you mean by, you know, shut up. God damn it. It's pro wrestling. Hell, I don't know what I meant. Do you know what you meant? So it just, that was not fun. Now getting Lawler was like night and day better. And, uh, those are days I look forward to every time we did voiceovers or what have you. That was, that was, that was money to me. I was back in my element where I wanted to be, where I felt like I needed to be. Well, the two days after WrestleMania nine, April 5th and 6th, you're where you need to be. Television is taped in Phoenix and Tucson. You're going to be covering all the superstars and challenge shows. They're going to air uh, through April and into May. And this is where we're really setting up the king of the ring, because as you might imagine, it's going to be a one night tournament, but we've got to have a qualifying series of matches to see who earns the shot. So we would see things like, um, Mr. Perfect and Doink the clown having two separate time limit draws. And then eventually they have a rubber match on raw. Uh, Luger is going to beat Bob Backlund. Razor Ramon is going to beat El Matador, Tito Santana. Hacksaw Jim Duggan would beat Papa Shango. The taco would beat giant Gonzalez by DQ. We should also mention that Bret Hart received a first round buy into the King of the ring tournament, and he's essentially named the number one seed. So he'll automatically make his way into the first round of the pay-per-view. I've heard different opinions over the years. Did you think that a tournament concept could work in wrestling as a pay-per-view? Not necessarily a, a television or a live event. I think that's different, but. A lot of times when we hear about a, a marquee matchup being main event of a pay-per-view, it's, it's mono, mono, it's two big guys on a poster. That's not really what a tournament allows though. All right. what do you think of the idea of a, a, a tournament on pay-per-view? I like the tournaments. I'm a tournament guy because they, they reflect back to uh, mainstream athletics, uh, tournament formats are, are not new. They're right. not new, they're not new at all. And they're accepted in the mainstream sports world as a way of determining something that you're shooting for. So I, I didn't have a problem with it at all. I thought it was going to be pretty good. And the tournament ended up being a nice tournament. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, I thought it was really well done and we had some good matches. I mean, Bret Hart was the difference in that tournament. Bret Hart made the whole event. And I think more than anything, it was just a start to get him more exposure and to get him moved, continue to move up. Cause Vince knew what he had planned for, for Brett, uh, over the long haul. And that false start in the WrestleMania nine was just like that, a false start. He, Vince saw that Brett was his show shape, show ready, ready to go. And finally got his opportunity, but Brett Hart made the King of the ring successful because of his performance. Brett Hart could have a different match on the same night on the same card with a variety of opponents and, uh, he never failed to, to, to execute. He never failed to entertain. He never failed to do his job. So Bret Hart was the deciding factor and the difference maker in the King of the ring that year. And then of course they shot the little angle at the end with Lawler and, uh, off we went. We, uh, we should also mention that this is an interesting era for wrestling creative. Talk about a little piece of creative here with a newcomer named Mike Shaw, who is, uh, going to be the mad monk yeah. shortly after renamed to Friar Ferguson and then completely repackaged as Bastion Booger. Too much, uh, ha -ha. 
too much. Ha ha. <laughs> the guy's a good worker. Yeah. Uh, I, I hired, I got him hired. Uh, thanks to Stu Hart's recommendation. When Stu recommended, because Mike had worked in Calgary for a long time and I saw his work in Calgary did not resemble his work in WWE. Uh, so he was, he, he just wasn't booked well in WWE because everybody has a different vision. If you're not the guy to hire somebody, then sometimes efforts are made to assassinate the hire. You know, what's this big fat guy going to do? What are we going to do with him? Blah, blah, blah. And he was a good worker. Uh, and he, he, he just, it just wasn't ex universally accepted by a lot of the guys behind the scenes and the guys behind the scenes oftentimes has Vince's ear and oftentimes they just, they shit on an idea. Then you shit on it long enough and often enough, the old man starts smelling it and talents out the door. But that was, that was too bad. Mike Shaw could have helped us if he had been booked in a more logical way. Sean Waltman is going to debut as the lightning kid defeating Louis Spicoli in a tryout, uh, more on the kid later, uh, Ron and Don Harris also get a tryout, but ultimately would not be signed for a couple of years. Are you at these tapings watching all these new cats? Are you being asked to give your feedback or are you still just trying to acclimate? Nobody asked for my feedback, Conrad. Okay. Uh, but I, I was around most of those tryouts. Because somebody would ask a question, what do you think of this guy? What do you think of that tryout? How, how, you know, this kind of thing. But I just wasn't in that role yet. I was an announcer. I was a JR, the executive. Eventually I would get there, but it was never my ultimate goal. It just happened to evolve in, in that manner. So, uh, but I was more one dimensional. I was a TV announcer and I didn't have a problem with that role. Quite honestly. I didn't need to be the head of talent relations. I never even dreamed that was an opportunity that I might be able to, uh, obtain. So you just have to, you just have to adjust. You know, I had a more of an administrative position in WCW during that era, during my early latter years in WCW, uh, but in WWE different ball game, different ball game. I was, I was just, uh, I was a television broadcaster. If, if I ask, I would provide feedback. If I saw something that was really, really, uh, that needed to be addressed, Connie, I would, uh, address it only as long as I was in the right company and around people I could trust. And quite honestly, I never really got that part of the job down. Well, cause it was hard to, who do you trust? Right. And, uh, that was hard to, hard to handle sometimes. Well, let's talk about uh, a live Monday night raw, just a couple of weeks after WrestleMania, we have sensational Sherry taking on Luna Vachon in a wild clothes ripping brawl. That's a little risque at the time for the WWF, but it does the highest cable rating for WWF programming in over a year. It does a 3.4. I'm curious. What do you remember your roles or responsibilities, if any, being at these Monday night raw, since you're not yet on the call, are you doing anything besides just, uh, hanging out? Going to catering. Yeah. <laughs> Along with Tony grid, Jim Myers, AKA George, the animal steel and other Jack lenses of the world. Uh, that was it. It was a boring trip for me to go to TV. I had nothing to do except run a tab on the, you know, T and a, is that, is that the word T and E travel and inter whatever this, I just was on the tab and, right. but I rode with the, the, a lot of the decision makers, you know, Vince wanted me to ride with him sometimes, you know, we, we're getting AEW is going to go to Canada soon and for extended days. And, uh, I remember riding with Vince from Calgary, Calgary, as they say up there to, uh, Edmonton and, uh, just he and I, cause everybody else bailed on us, you know, as long as Vince had a, somebody with him, Patterson and Bruce thought everything is going to be okay. Cause they got away from Vince for a little while. Don't blame them. They were, I guess I said earlier, 
cliche joined at the hip situation. So, uh, so we rode, we, we rode from, uh, at the highest rate of speed I can ever remember. I was scared shitless Calgary to Calgary to uh, Edmonton. And we saw the Northern lights and we, we had an interesting talk. I never done We never had any bad words. I just, I, got, I don't think he wanted the South on this show. He didn't want the South to rise again. And, uh, so he was going to make sure that did not occur. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, a Monday night raw interview. We would see from Bret Hart. He's going to list his hit list that includes Lex Luger, Yokozuna and Hulk Hogan. And Meltzer would speculate in the observer that Brett mentioning Hogan was potentially a tease for the two to main event SummerSlam that year. And there's a pretty legendary story that there was a photo op done where it had the two guys playing tug of war with the world title. And of course we know that match never happens, but Brett would write in his book that Vince told him that was the plan that Hogan would drop the title to Brett. And then of course Hogan refused and put Yoko over at King of the ring instead. Do you remember hearing the rumor in innuendo that you guys were hoping to get to Hogan versus Brett at SummerSlam? Yeah. 93? Oh yeah. Common, common, common gossip, common cannon fodder. Absolutely. That was a plan Hogan to anoint Brett and Brett to become the number one guy. And it, for whatever reason Hogan had, and I don't still don't understand it. You can't say that it was because, well, Hogan didn't want to lose the title to a lesser guy. To a weak successor. There's no way you can convince me that Bret Hart was a weak successor. Uh, it was the right thing to do. He was the hottest thing we had. He was young enough to have a long run. He could have really, really good matches with anybody, which is the mark of a great worker. Uh, it didn't matter if the, the, the person he was wrestling was a baby face or a heel. Bret would make them look better than they were. But for whatever reason, Hogan, and I, I guess it never changed, did it? He never did want to, something was there. He didn't want to lose the title of Brett. And I don't, I never have understood that. I really haven't. It's just illogical. At least it is in my opinion. Let's talk about, uh, Hogan, because he's going to make a little trip over to new Japan to do a one-off at the Tokyo dome. He's going to defeat the great Muda in a non-title match. This happens on May 3rd. And boy, there's some big news coming out of it. And I can't wait to get your reaction or what you remember Vince's reaction being to this report in the observer quote, the biggest news was the interview that Hogan did with the press after the show in which he said he was very happy to be back with new Japan. I'm a five time WWF champion. And he shows the belt to me, this holding the WWF title is a toy like a Christmas tree ornament. The WWF belt is like a Honda. The IWGP belt is like a Rolls Royce. It's a real world championship belt. Winning this, the WWF title was very easy. The IWGP belt is very hard to win. I can wrestle. They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I'm the old dog, but I know all the tricks. I never quit wrestling. I'm not one of those guys coming back, disgracing my former reputation. I'm still the best wrestler. The match today was fun, but it was easy. He is a star, but I beat him one, two, three in the middle. I should be wearing the IWGP belt. I want to wrestle every top name in Japan and hopefully wrestle Mr. Inoki again. Now he's saying all of this when clearly he's thinking he's winding up his business with the WWF, but this has to. Or I shouldn't say have to, I imagine this pisses off Vince McMahon. My goodness. Why wouldn't it? Yeah. He's made the guy rich and famous. Yes. He's on top of the world. He was, everything was built around him. So why aren't you professional enough? You're speaking of Hulk to do the right thing for the business. You want out your, that, that promo would have led me to believe that you want out. Right. So let's get you out of here. And to do that, you got to, there's got to be a successor. And, and, and why I couldn't have been Bret Hart. I will still, like I said earlier, I don't know. I probably will never know, but, uh, it was, I thought it was a cheap shot and I thought it was the sign of, 
you know, there's so much paranoia, Conrad, in wrestling, especially guys that wanting to put somebody, not wanting to put somebody over as if it's real. I don't get that. I don't get that at all. I thought Hogan was being unfair. He made a fortune. He became, like I said, rich and famous. Uh, cause I can promise you that, uh, new Japan would not want Hogan. If he couldn't, if he, if he wasn't rich and famous, he was a star, right? So, uh, and who made him a star? Vince made Hogan a star and, but somewhere along the way, the, the waters get muddy and you all of a sudden find out that, uh, you know, maybe you're not as great as you think you were. And it took a team to. As they say, it takes a village to raise a family or raise children or something. The village to do something. Village to raise a child, yeah. Yeah. So it was just, I never understood that. I mean, Hogan should have been extremely uh, uh, happy. He should have been extremely thankful that he got this major break. And look, he didn't do it by himself. Uh, he, uh, the WWE didn't do it with, without Hogan. Hogan played his role. But it's, there's a time for everybody, you know, someday Roman Reigns is going to lose the title in WWE and it's just going to be time. Mm -hmm. And so, but Hogan never saw it that way. He, he, uh, I, I, I never understood. That was always a, I was always kind of confused about his, sometimes his motivation, but to not want to put Bret Hart, who was one of the best workers and maybe the best worker in the world at that time. Pure worker, maybe uh, that that was what that's what Bret Hart was. So if I were Hogan, I'd say, "Well, I know he's going to make me look great. I know we're going to have a hell of a contest. I know he's going to take care of me because he wants me to shine before he beats me, which is just logical. Any opponent should want their adversary to shine before they lose. Just makes sense." So I don't know. That was just a lot of ego out of control, paranoia, wrestler paranoia is the worst kind of paranoia there is. It seems to me like, especially during that period of time, I think that whole concept has lessened, uh, significantly, uh, since that era, it doesn't seem to be as topical or as talked about, uh, cause these guys are making so much money. They finally realize, look, you don't want to. You don't want to shoot the goddamn goose that laid the golden eggs. Right. What are you thinking? So, uh, I, I just, I've never understood that. Now I've never been a wrestler. I've never been a star. So maybe I don't get it. Okay. I say that I don't get it. You're not one of the boys. JR. You don't get it. Okay. So I don't get it, but to me, it's still illogical. Let's talk about, uh, something written in the observer that made me laugh. Nobody's told me this, but Jim Ross seems to have already gained enormous influence in what is going on. Number one, Vince McMahon. It was, it was my hair, Conrad. See that hair? That's fantastic. <laughs> hair. If you're not watching on YouTube. You got to go see this. Uh, he would write number one, Vince McMahon talking about Mr. Huge college football background on superstars and the Steiner's college degree. People all thought that Vince would change Jim Ross's announcing style when it looks like it's the other way around. Number two. A tournament on television during sweeps. Number three, Bonnie Blackstone getting a tryout to host stand up interviews a la Gene Okerlund. Number four, Bruce Pritchard getting a television role as a color commentator, The Wizard. Number five, the big <laughs> the push for Mr. Hughes, who Ross has always been high on. While I don't know if Ross had anything to do with any of this, it doesn't seem coincidental. Do you think maybe the, uh, Maybe, maybe Meltzer's onto something. Maybe you were having an influence over Vince. I think so. Yeah. But I did it quietly and I did it in a conversational way, not a confrontational way. And that always worked uh, for my communication with Vince. And I think uh, my, my organizational skills and things like that opened his eyes that, Hey, maybe this guy can help us in more ways than just announce challenge. And so, you know, then it ended up, I ended up with a hell of a run with a lot of responsibility. I mean, he turned the, he turned the events Vince would eventually after JJ left, he made the, he made Vincent, uh, excuse me, he made Bruce and I, the kind of the co, uh, got code share this job. And, 
and Bruce was miserable in all the, the I think he'd probably tell you that in all yeah, the paperwork. He hated Pardon it. Me? He yeah. hated it. Well, Bruce liked creative. Yes. And, he's, and he was good at it. So that's kind of where that, that job then separated back to one job. And that was me. And, uh, so, but that wouldn't have happened if I didn't communicate well with the old man. And, uh, and we started building something special there in that talent relations department. Look at the talent speaks for itself. Millionaires, hall of famers, main eventers, WrestleMania exposure in a positive way. It was just, uh, yeah, everything started coming together. We mentioned Bonnie Blackstone. Uh, she's going to get a tryout uh, at the Worcester Mass taping and the Portland yeah. Maine taping. Um, what do you think? Do you think she could have been a good fit? Yeah, but she's going to fight the same battle that I was fighting. That's a Southern accent. Right. She had a good look, uh, reliable, professional. You know, she wasn't sleeping with everybody. She wasn't getting drunk. Uh, she, she had the right skill set, but still she's going to battle that one thing. She's got a Southern accent, Southern drawl, as we say, but, uh, I thought she had a chance to get, to get where she wanted to go. Vince liked her. She had a good look. And again, she was in trouble. She didn't, uh, she didn't have a, uh, an ego that was so unmanageable that it couldn't be controlled and, and handled. Something that has always stuck out to me is, is how much talent is moving around here. And we mentioned some of the other tryouts and debuts, but this is the era where we see Jerry, the King Lawler, get his own talk show type segment, King's court and it debuts on wrestling challenge. And we see the debut of the smoking guns, Bart and Billy. They're going to make their WWF television debuts here as the cowboy style brothers from Texas. It's pretty amazing that that Billy's still going today in AEW 30 years later. Yeah. Scissor me, daddy ass. <laughs> That's something we expect to hear you say. And it makes me laugh every time. Uh, Taz even gets a tryout match here. That's right. Taz in the WWF in 1993, he defeats the future Scotty too hottie at the time. Just wrestling a Scott Taylor, man. Th- we're trying new gimmicks here. You know, I-, I could have seen Taz in this Tasmanian devil type character in the WWF. I mean, I'm sure you had more fun as the badass character we saw in ECW, but man, what if, what if Taz joined up here and got on the pirate ship 30 years ago? I, uh, uh, I hired Taz under the guise of him being the killer, uh, that he was in ECW, uh, Tasmaniac was fine, uh, but it wasn't what I was looking for. I thought, uh, Taz had an amazingly upward mobility, uh, and we could use him. And yeah. I think that was evidenced by the fact that the pop that he got when he made his debut in the garden, uh, it's, it's uh, tremendous. It's just too, you know, Taz just, he got hurt and, you know, that's part of the damn game. Unfortunately, thick muscle guys, uh, pulling things, tearing things, so forth. But, uh, luckily for him, uh, he worked really hard on becoming an announcer because that seemed to be the hand that was dealt him. So, uh, but yeah, I, I like, I like Taz's upside. I remember talking, I remember I kept his number on my desk for a long time, uh, before I followed up because there was a, there was a, there was a point in time there where, you know, Taz is a uh, real name is uh, Peter Cernicia. And that's what the, the, my old phone message said, you know, P- Peter Cernicia and his number. Well, show you how my naivete is. I didn't know who that was mm. until I found out, I think maybe Heyman told me, but we liked him and thought he could do a good job for us. And, and he did while he was healthy. Just one of those guys that got, could catch a break on his health side. And, uh, I liked his upside. Taz was a, he was a keeper. And I, like I said, that was to me, that was largely validated by the reception in the garden that Taz got when he came out. I think he worked at Kurt angle as he did. Yeah. And so, Ended uh, Kurt angle streak and, uh, just quick little cliff note. Uh, if you ever have the good fortune of meeting Taz in real life, don't fuck around and call him Pete. 
he is Taz to you, uh, or you will get dumped <laughs> on your head. If you're going to do that, you better have started your day with some athletic greens because you're going to need all the help you can get. Amen, brother. We love athletic greens here on the program with just one delicious scoop of AG one. You're getting 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, literally everything you need to help you start your day. Right. It's a special blend of ingredients to support your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, your focus, your recovery, your aging, all of the things. And somehow it still tastes good. There's no artificial anything. There's no nasty chemicals. It's lifestyle friendly too, man. Whether you're doing keto or paleo, or maybe you're vegan or dairy free or gluten free, well, AG1's for you. We're talking less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs. I mean, how do you beat this? It's going to help you get better sleep, better recovery, better mental clarity, better alertness. Think of it as like your all in one nutritional insurance. And Jim and I are big fans of this product, but so is everybody else. They've got over 7,000 five star reviews. And right now, we think it's time for you to reclaim your health, arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. So to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash JR. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash JR to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. That's athleticgreens.com slash JR. I use it. Tony uses it. Jeff uses it. Eric uses it. Everybody loves Athletic Greens, and we know you will too. It tastes great, doesn't it, Jim? Absolutely. It's a spot. Every day, it takes about two minutes. Let's, uh, let's keep it going here and remind everybody that this is the era where we would see Brian Clark debut as Adam Bomb here in the WWF. He's got Johnny Polo by his side. Of course, we know Johnny Polo is going to go on to become Raven. What do you think of that pairing or just the Johnny Polo character uh, on its own? Was it too animated to be put with this serious Adam Bomb character? Why don't you think either really enjoyed success in the company under these gimmicks? Well, they just didn't have chemistry. Uh, you know, uh, Adam bomb is that who it was Adam bomb. Yep. Uh, had great upside, great look more specifically. Uh, but, uh, the, the charisma on that unit was, uh, primarily monopolized by Raven, Johnny Polo. Uh, so he was, uh, it, it, it never clicked for me. I know, uh, Bruce is very close to, uh, Brian, uh, and that helped Brian get a job, which is fine. It worked. It'd been a great idea. I just never thought that he had the charisma to back up a main event role. And, uh, unfortunately I was right on that one. And Johnny Polo just kept shooting himself in the foot, you know, discipline issues, unprofessional conduct or something, whatever it could be created. Uh, he was a victim of, so I never, they look good on an eight by 10, uh, you know, Brian, he's a big monstrous guy. It looked great. And Scotty could talk as good as anybody, but for whatever reason, when he put them together, it just didn't come out the way you wanted it. So I don't think they, the two of them had chemistry with each other to any degree that was marketable. Let's, uh, let's talk about Mr. Hughes. He's going to go on to defeat Kamala in another King of the ring qualifier. Uh, Sean Michaels and crush are going to go to a double count out on superstars. So they're both eliminated from the tournament. And it's instead announced that Sean and crush are going to square off at the pay-per-view for the intercontinental title. And over on Monday night raw, we would see bam, bam defeat typhoon in another King of the ring qualifier. Mr. Perfect would finally beat Doink the Clown. It's a pretty damn good match. They even do a switcheroo with a second Doink. This time it's Steve Kern swapping places with the original Doink, Matt Bourne. I have always thought this was a gimmick that maybe people just said, oh, a clown? I don't like that. But an evil clown, because there are a lot of people who were scared of clowns. I mean, I'm not one of them, but I understand that phobia <laughs> exists. I get that, and, and I... I think, especially in this era where it's targeted at children more than it is maybe now, I like the idea 
of a heel clown. What did you think? I, I didn't like, I didn't dislike it at all. I think, uh, we got to take in consideration that, you know, Matt Bourne, when he was right and healthy and straight, uh, he was one of the best workers in the business, really strong, fundamentally sound. His dad was a wrestler, you know, they, that Portland territory was their training ground. Uh, tough Tony Bourne was, uh, was, uh, Matt's dad. I thought Matt was just a hell of a hand. He kind of lost his fire when, uh, I saw him as, uh, big, what was he? Big Jake or big Luke or big something the, the lumberjack guy. Yeah. Uh, that didn't fit him either, but he was a great worker. And I'm with you, Conrad, the evil clown thing worked for me. I didn't have a problem with it whatsoever. And look at those matches he had with perfect shit. They were, they were, they were money. Those guys could work together and they made each other better. I thought so. Uh, he, he was a, he was a, Matt was a player. If Matt could have stayed off the, the shit, uh, he would have had a amazing final career, but he couldn't stay straight. On, uh, Monday night raw on May 17th, we have maybe our most notable raw to date so far. Sean Waltman has wrestled the previous two weeks as the kamikaze kid, then the cannonball kid losing to doink and then Mr. Hughes. And these are your standard fair enhancement matches. Some people right. might even call them squash matches. Now he's just called the kid on this day here on May 17th. And he somehow pulls an upset victory over Razor Ramon, and thus the one, two, three kid is born. This is one of the first great angles and one of the most monumental moments in Monday Night Raw history. What do you think of this presentation to bring him in as essentially an enhancement talent and then give him this upset win? Man, a star is born here, no? Yeah, in three weeks. About three weeks, a star is born. So the audience is ready for a new. Uh, we always talked about wrestling fans like new, and this is certainly that. So, uh, and then getting a, a win, you know, let's not discount the fact that, you know, uh, razor looked at Sean Waltman, like a little brother, he wanted to help him hence volunteering to do the honors in that match. So, uh, I, I liked that whole storyline. I, I thought it was good. It made, uh. The one, two, three kid, X Pac, whatever his events are going to be, it made him a star. It created awareness for him. And uh, so I, I thought it was, it had some money because, again, it was new and it was fresh. And the kid is a hell of a worker. He did things that uh, a lot of guys do now, as a matter of factly, with all the flips and flops and stuff. But uh, he was, uh, he was awesome. And, and Scott Hall did the right thing in helping a friend get over. And he did a good job of it too. It was, he did, nobody could have done any better than Scott helping out Sean. It was an amazing moment. And on that same raw, we saw Yokozuna defeat Kamala in a battle of the behemoths. Marty Jannetty would make a surprise return and defeat Sean Michaels for the intercontinental title. As a reminder, Jannetty had been fired back in January, uh, following the Royal rumble pay-per-view before getting rehired here, a story we would say over and over and over with Marty Jannetty. Uh, Marty's reign, of course, is short-lived. Just after three weeks, he loses the title back to Sean at a house show in Albany, New York, thanks to some help from the now-debuting Kevin Nash, who's going to show up here as Diesel. Did you have any help in bringing Nash up from WCW at all? Not really. Not really. Okay. You know, Kevin's a friend of mine. Sure. Somebody would have asked me. I said, he's, he's a buddy. I think he can help us. He was the perfect bodyguard for Sean size wise. The dimensions were there, the look, uh, everything. Uh, and you know, little, little did we know that or little did I know that eventually, uh, Kevin Nash would have the same, be on the same level, same platform as Sean, as far as being a, a champion and all that good stuff. So, uh, I thought it was a good hire. I thought it was a real good hire. I thought there was a mileage left in Kevin. Uh, he, he fit well into that particular locker room. So, uh, I thought it was a good move for our company to get Kevin there. And like I said, he paired up, uh, wonderfully with, uh, Sean Michaels. They look good on an eight by 10, say the least. We, uh, 
We got to mention Hulk Hogan wrestles his first WWF match since April 4th at WrestleMania on May 22nd. And he's involved in a handful of tag matches, teaming with Brutus Beefcake to unsuccessfully challenge Ted DiBiase and IRS for the tag belts. They even had Sergeant Slaughter as the guest referee. And Hogan never makes an in arena television appearance between WrestleMania and King of the Ring. Instead, he just sends in taped promos where he's down on the set of Thunder in Paradise. My goodness, in hindsight, Vince going with Hogan here at WrestleMania is repaid with him making his television show a priority over taping TV for the WWF, making shots for New Japan at the Tokyo Dome instead of working with the WWF. And then afterwards saying this belt's a toy and I want to wrestle all the top guys here and win your much more prestigious belt, putting the belt on Hogan at WrestleMania nine has to be the first misstep that you personally witnessed of Vince McMahon. Like this has to be a real head scratcher from a guy who's been in the game 20 years at this point. Right? Yeah, it was, uh, I didn't see the commitment that Hogan had. I didn't see it. Uh, and a lot, a lot of the talent didn't see it either. So it caused a lot of unrest. You got guys on the road full time, working a very heavy schedule, having uh, strong matches that were less meaningful because they weren't champions or they weren't in an established program. Uh, I just didn't, I just, I don't understand the lack of commitment, especially when you're, you're being paid, you, you made a fortune and that's why you're there. Nobody bullshit you Conrad. It's all about the money. Cash and creative is always going to be the king. And this is about, this for Hogan was about uh, the cash. He wanted more money. He wanted, and he knew to get more money. He had to be the, on top of the card. So it just didn't seem right. I never did understand if, his, if Hogan was going to be committed enough to come back, reestablish himself and try to get onto another run. Uh, but, uh, we got, th- we got those answers eventually. It's, uh, it's not even Vince's priority. You know, it's easy for us to be critical of Vince here, but here's what's going on behind the scenes. Quote, Vince McMahon resigned as president of Titan sports approximately two weeks ago in a major news item that has been largely kept hush hush McMahon, who was both president and chief executive officer of the largest wrestling company in the United States, apparently had the company control transferred to his wife, Linda, a few weeks ago, either on or just before May 14th. Vince remains CEO of Titan sports and will remain as a television personality. Titan has not publicly released this information in press release fashion, although several sources within the organization have admitted it was true and the public relations department has confirmed the story. Aside from the obvious speculation regarding the, this somehow being tied to the ongoing federal investigation, no other details or significance is known. So I'm saying all that to say, listen, it's easy to be critical of Vince here. And certainly I have been on this program, but dude, in the scheme of things, who the champion is and what Hulk Hogan is or isn't doing is a lot less important than, are we going to lose our company? Am I going to lose my freedom? There's bigger fish to fry. This is a stressful time for the chairman. No, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. And I felt very obligated because he gave me a shot. Uh, when I, when I left WCW, uh, he gave me this opportunity to go continue to make a damn good living. Uh, it just had a rocky, be- rough, rocky beginning. Uh, but yeah, I would prioritize maintaining the health of my company over who's going to be the next champion in a fictitious world. So, uh, I, 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 that I'm, I'm with you on that concept, that theory. So it it was just, he he had to fight for his, you know, Hey, this son of a bitch could have gone to jail. I mean, you know, there were people in the, in the company that were almost, uh, hell bent that he, Vince is going to prison. I never thought it was that extreme because there's all the white collar crimes and all that stuff. And he had not been proven guilty. He was innocent until proven guilty. So uh, I don't know, Connie, I think, uh, maintaining the health of my company is much more important than who's going to be the next champ. No doubt about it. Um, 
we should talk about a meeting that happened. I want to know if you were there. This is the write up from Dave. It was already reported elsewhere that on May 24th in Halifax, Nova Scotia, there was a production meeting in which Vince McMahon, who's been the president of the company since taking over for this father in 82, told employees that Linda was now in charge of the company and also acknowledged the federal investigation. However, from the outside, there doesn't seem to be any significant change in the operation of the company. And many employees of the company weren't even aware of the switch in the company and presidency as of late, uh, as of press time. The only attempt at press coverage regarding this was a press release item by Titan sent to the New York times wire services that to the best of our knowledge, didn't run in any newspapers, which didn't mention any change in the organizational presidency, but largely focused on Linda McMahon with mentions of the couple's son, Shane and daughter, Stephanie. Linda, whose title as executive vice president of Titan sports before this change in title was according to one Titan source, theoretically on equal power footing as the other company vice presidents, but this put her unequivocally as more powerful. So listen, uh, on the one hand, I feel like they're probably trying to not make this a big deal, but to hold a meeting and tell everybody, Hey, Linda's in charge now. Uh, oh yeah. I'm also being investigated by the federal government. Do you remember being in that meeting? I think I was, but oh, I was wow. aware of everything. I knew everything was going, going to go down. Um, so it wasn't new news. It was a blockbuster news. I'd already been exposed to it. Uh, yeah, it was just, uh, again, that really crazy time. I, we're, we're in unprecedented waters at, at, during that era. And, uh, all I knew is, is that taking it that seriously as he should, it might open up an opportunity for good old JR to get back on TV. And that happened. Let's talk about, uh, morale. Meltzer would write that it was way down because there were a lot of shows that had less than a thousand fans in attendance. And a lot of the face to face segments are taped on Tuesdays and sometimes run over to Wednesdays in the offices in Stanford. And there's a lot of guys who live out of town. So that means instead of being home, they're out of town doing these countless localized interviews. And then they get to the shows. And there's almost nobody there and then they have to do a live Monday night raw, but that's only 150 bucks per shot. This is a, a stressful time. There's probably a lot of frustration. I know we, you and I have talked a lot that, that wrestling, we both believe to be cyclical, but are you thinking, man, with Vince in trouble, attendance is down. Guys are I, driving didn't, up, Conrad, hey, I didn't, I, I didn't panic. I didn't okay. panic and I didn't have no knee jerks. Okay. I couldn't look, I've learned along the way not to stress over things you can't control. Right. I couldn't control what Vince's strategy, he and Jerry McDivitt, the lawyer were going to do how they're going to you know, defend the company, but I knew it was going to be a battle because I, I, uh, I think I was, I, I think I testified in that trial. Seems like I did. But anyway, uh, so yeah, I, I was aware of, of all those things, but I, 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 I was just waiting for a tap on the shoulder and said, you're up. And that was important to me to prove that I could carry my share of the water in the, one of the most trying times in the history of the company. So I might not be good enough to be on challenge, but all of a sudden, boom, you look around, oh, JR's on raw and I was on raw for a few weeks. And it worked. So that gave me confidence that maybe when this all is said and done, I may still have a, a job and it didn't look like I was going to have a job, but cause I got basically furloughed or whatever the hell, but it's just up and down, up and down. It got to be a little bit, uh, tedious. If I hadn't been such a stupid mark for wrestling, I don't, I'm sure I would have stayed. When I got my, when I got my son, another contract and I made sure I had a back end package because I just had the confidence. I didn't have the confidence. I was going to be kept. And I started looking for other things to do. And it didn't have anything to do with wrestling because I thought that was my option. And, uh, so, you know, the story goes on, you know, it's just you, you, any, you read slobber knocker or under the black hat, some of those 
a couple of my books uh, kind of explains it pretty good. Uh, but it wasn't no fun, Conrad. I, I wasn't sure. You know, little Jan and I just got married. And we got married in 93, I think it was. So uh, here I, I brought her in this goddamn mess. Stupid ass wrestling politics and other outside politics and this, that, and the other. It was hard. Yeah. It's hard to be happily married when you're not sure what tomorrow brings. And so uh, I remember telling her, I said, well, you know, we, we knew it was going to happen. And it has happened. I got to let go again. But I, again, I, on the on the backside of it, I had a little bit of leverage, which is why I, I I added a clause in my contract that would allow me to, uh, you know, get a little walk away package, which I thought was one of the smarter things I've done, because I knew that on that package in the back end, I had, I was going to get enough money that I could I could live on it for a good while. So Jan and I just picked up and moved back to Atlanta. And, uh, that's where you start learning about a lot of things about, you know, being ignored, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind, that type of stuff. You find out that your friends in wrestling are few and far between. Iconic wrestler Kevin Von Erich just announced his first public tour. The show, titled Stories from the Top Rope, will feature Von Erich sharing insight into his career, personal triumphs, and tragedies. Stories from the Top Rope will go on sale June 2nd at EmporiumPresents.com and will offer a very limited number of VIP tickets, which include a meet and greet and photo op. Von Erich, now 65, will be the subject of a major motion picture, Iron Claw, which stars Zac Efron and is slated for release later this year. See Kevin Von Erich live September 1st in Dallas, September 2nd in San Antonio, September 3rd in Corpus Christi, September 5th in Houston, September 6th in Shreveport, September 8th in Oklahoma City, September 9th in Amarillo, and September 10th in Midland. Tickets on sale at EmporiumPresents.com. Did you see the WWF potentially turning into a regional promotion again with all the issues that were going on at the time? I thought that was very possible. And they had this great territory Northeast yeah, or population. So yeah, I, I, I kind of thought that might happen. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, I get another call <laughs> Poor Jan. She didn't, she, she had to think that I'm in the craziest freaking business alive out there available, but she stuck with me, man. She knew how much the wrestling business meant to me as it, as it does today. It may mean more to me now than I, I should let it, but it does. And so, uh, all I knew is, is that I was, <clears throat> I got called off the bench. I took my visor off. I put my helmet back on. I got in the game and, and we're going to play and see where it takes us. And we all know how that story ended. Well, let's talk about the pay-per-view. When do you find out you're going to be on commentary for this? Did you knew all along? No shit. No, all along. I probably knew earlier in the week. Okay. I'm guessing earlier, earlier in the week. Well, let's get to the show. It's critically acclaimed, uh, 71% thumbs up in the observer. Anytime you get Bret Hart working three times on a show, it's going to be like that. The observer had this to say the first King of the ring pay-per-view show, as opposed to the first King of the ring tournament featured Yokozuna winning the WWF title from Hulk Hogan and Bret Hart going over in the tournament. It was largely praised as the best WWF pay-per-view show since the 92 SummerSlam show from London. Ironically, the star of that show, Bret Hart, who apparently went in with an injured ankle and came out hurt enough that he missed the next night's TV tapings was a one man show this time, making the difference between a largely uneventful show and a very good one. As many have noted, the WWF is turning into a Memphis style promotion with more frequent angles, title changes, and new scenarios created, which make it more intriguing for a hardcore audience and harder to follow for a casual audience. Since the overall casual interest has decreased so much over the past year, this may not be the worst idea. The Hogan Yokozuna title switch apparently sets up a rematch between the two at the SummerSlam show 
on August 30th at the Palace of Auburn Hills, Michigan. So we know that match is not going to take place. This is Hogan's last televised appearance. We didn't know that immediately after the show, but I can't help but wonder, do you think Dave Meltzer knew perhaps that Vince McMahon was having more regular communication with Jerry Jarrett? Or is he making this Memphis assertion simply because Jerry Lawler was involved on camera so much? I think it was a combination of things. You know, Jared's influence was uh, obvious, well known, not a good kept secret. If it's supposed to be a secret, I don't know. Uh, it looked like Vince is getting a backup plan, right? Uh, together, you know, and and Jared had been a very successful uh, wrestling businessman, and so I'm sure Vince is going to at some point rely on uh, Jerry, uh, to help keep the business focused. You know, the, the bottom line here, it's real simple. We didn't have enough people over. We didn't have any heels or any great heat. The Bret Hart thing is on, off, on, off. You got the title. The title picture is murky with Hogan. Uh, Cause I don't think Vince ever was sold on after he saw what Hogan had said at a time or two and this, that, and the other, I, I just don't think that uh, Vince was comfortable with the Hogan situation because he didn't want to work full time. You can't have the star of the show not be available and, uh, talents now that think, well, I don't, I can leverage my way off this weeks, this day of TV or this week of TV or whatever it may be. It's silly. Take as much TV exposure as you can get. If your boss is offering you TV time, take it, take it. Well, I don't want to get overexposed. You know, hey, fuck that idiot. You ain't going to get overexposed. If you go out and be entertaining and kick ass. Now you're talking positive business. So, uh, I just overexpose. It's just talents that do that now are are showing their little muscles that I can get by with this. I, you know, Roman Reigns takes off an enormous amount of time. MJF takes off a lot of time. So if their bosses are happy with that arrangement, then so be it. Good. I don't think it's a good policy. I think, every, I think it's a team. I mean, we're, we're a team and the team needs to be together more often than they're not. And I, I've always believed that and I always will believe that. They don't mean you have to wrestle a match every week, but you need to get your face on television. I need to hear from you. If nothing else. And, uh, you know, Hogan was sending those, those interviews in and all the interviews were backdrops from, uh, his TV show. Right. So he's like, we all get it. You're promoting your television show. Thunder in paradise. I actually like that show. It wasn't bad. So, uh, it was just unsettling. We had to get, we had to get everything put back together and form that team back and get some talent over and all the things we've talked about here today. We've never talked about any of the talents becoming red hot heels where people would pay to see them get their ass whipped. All we've talked about is baby faces and ironically, none of them got over. Well, they, none of them were over at that point in time. Better said. Let's, uh, let's talk about the show. We got 6,500 fans here paying a legitimate sellout gate of, uh, just under $80,000. It's at the Nutter arena in Dayton, Ohio. And, uh, we get started with a banger, Bret Hart and razor Ramon go 10 minutes and 27 seconds. It's a three-star match. Brett wins. Uh, he's going to come in limping. He's hurt uh, legitimately. Uh, razor is going to go for a backward suplex. And Brett is going to turn in midair and fall on him for the three count. Heck of a way to start the show, man. Two of your very best in the ring doing what they do best. And it's pretty crazy to think about how loaded this roster is considering, you know, just not, where not selling tickets. Yeah. Like it's not clicking. <laughs> and I think that just proves that it's, it's cyclical. Um, Next up, we got Mr. Perfect and Mr. Hughes. Mr. Perfect gets the win by DQ in six minutes and two seconds. Uh, it's a DQ finish. Um, that meant that finish indicated that 
Mr. Hughes was still considered a potential player. Yes. If not, he would have put uh, perfect, which I would have done anyway, but perfect over, uh, with a submission or, or a one, two, three. Here's the, here's the reason he gets the DQ too. Curtis is going to use, uh, the urn that he stole from undertaker on the television show that aired that same weekend. So clearly we're planning to have Mr. Hughes work with the undertaker. This is, uh, that's good news. I mean, the undertaker is one of our biggest stars here. Yeah. And at this point they're going to interview Mr. Fuji and it's maybe not the best interview we ever heard, but it was a Fuji interview. Mm -hmm. And Meltzer would say the only interesting part of the interview is the new storyline is that when Hogan beat Yokozuna at mania, he had just finished a grueling 20 minute match with Hart, And later in the show, Bobby Heenan amended it by saying it was a 30 minute match. Of course, in actuality, it was eight minutes. And Meltzer <laughs> has fun with this and says by next year's WrestleMania, they'll talk about how the 650 pound Yokozuna went a full hour the previous year. Fun stuff. That's what we do in wrestling though. Uh, next up, Bam Bam Bigelow and Jim Duggan. Duggan's going to try a spear, miss, and hit the turnbuckle. Bigelow then scores the pin after a headbutt off the top rope. Uh, they go four minutes and 59 seconds. Bam Bam gets the win. You know, this is uh, maybe Duggan a little past his expiration date with this look and character and gimmick. It feels like it's something from 10 years prior. But, you know, hey, he still gets a pop. He still gets a reaction spot for him here on the card. And next up, Tataka and Lex Luger. Go to a 15 minute draw. That's a lot of time on pay-per-view. Both of them are eliminated though. Neither advances. Can't figure out a finish. It keeps the talents happy. That's all that was a political finish. Crazy. Somebody, if you're not a good enough worker to be able to complete your business in that three seconds, it takes to lose or win, then you don't need to be on TV uh, protecting. Now I, I guarantee you. There's very few people in the world that have recently thought about the finish between Lex Luger and Tatanka. Not one person, not a damn soul. No. So instead of having a lackluster flaccid, uh, like, uh, finish, we, we, uh, we do a, a lazy man's finish. And I, I just, I just never liked that. Cause I put myself in the fans position. You could just as easily have been a finish close. There's a lot of ways to work it, but why not? As opposed to having a disqualification because they're just so benign. They don't have enough pizzazz, at least in my opinion, you can make them work, but it's, it's not on the first night in type thing. It's you got to have a little program around it so that the DQ means something. So I, I'm a, a big fan of winners and losers. I think the fans deserve that. And if we can't be smart enough to work out a finish, uh, that doesn't kill us. And what would do that? What would kill us? I don't know. I think it's all political and it's just a way for the agent to get around from having to justify what Vince wants or Vince is doing it because he wants, he wants to keep peace in the Valley. It shows you how by the seat of our pants, we are at times here. <clears throat> I just want to remind everybody this show happens in June. You know, the, the King of the ring here is in June and we know that the next big pay-per-view is going to be SummerSlam. So just again, this is June 13th. And we think when Meltzer publishes the observer, it's going to be Hogan and Yokozuna in a rematch. <laughs> at SummerSlam, mm -hmm. but on the heels of, I mean, just a month prior in May, Meltzer thought it would be Brett and Hogan. We know it's not going to be Brett and Hogan. We know it's not going to be Hogan and Yokozuna. It's going to be Hogan and Luger and Luger. Who's wrestling here in, in this narcissist persona that had this big pomp and circumstance debut. And certainly the big presentation at WrestleMania, he can't even beat Tataka, but just Two and a half weeks after this, he's going to body slam Yokozuna on the intrepid. And we're going to start building him as our American hero to take down this evil Yokozuna in August. This booking is mid June. On, yeah. Booking on the fly. Yeah. Uh, that's called all the politics and the, and the debates going back and forth. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, 
I'm right along with you there, Conrad. It just, it didn't, it didn't make any sense. It just didn't make any sense. And a lot of it is appeasing talent. And to and make I, it worse is, is after the match, you know, it goes to a draw, but after the match, Luger's going to knock out Tatanka. He's going to take off the elbow pad and hit him with that steel plate in the forearm. So like he's, he's even doing heel stuff after the match, but just a few weeks after this, we're going to body slam Yokozuna and he's your American hero. Th that wasn't the a plan. It wasn't the plan B it's the plan C it's plan C at best. I mean, it's just, uh, it's an interesting time for the company to say the least. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Next up, we get an incredible match Four and a quarter stars go out of your way to watch it. They get plenty of time to Bret Hart and Mr. Perfect go 1855. It is an incredible match. If you saw them wrestle at SummerSlam 91 in Madison square garden, you were itching to see it just under two years later. And you were glad you did. If you're going to watch one match on the show, make it this one. Yep. It's just freaking phenomenal. There's nothing else we could say about it. And this is probably the first great match you've called in the company at this point, right? Yeah, probably so. Yeah, yeah. it was right up there, man. It was a good match. Those guys are just, they had their working shoes on. Uh, they wanted to impress the boys in the back. Uh, they're both were getting elevated on the card. So I, I thought it was a terrific. Those guys are just, they delivered big time. They needed to deliver a quality match. And what was the finish? Uh, it's a, it's a good one. Go out of your way to see it. Um, we've got uh, Hart taking a bump off the apron onto the guardrail, and it looks like it's going to be a, a big injury. They trade back and forth moves for near falls and very believable submissions. And Savage is on commentary, maybe not doing any favors, saying neither one of these guys will ever give up. And ultimately, Brett winds up winning reversing an inside cradle and both guys stand up and shake hands, making sure that the fans know, Hey, there are no bad guys here. Everybody's a good guy. <laughs> we just had a competitive match and it was an old school wrestling move that did it. Just reversing an inside cradle. Yeah. That works. That, yeah. That'll work. It's a wrestling hold. That'll work. And, uh, and it did work that night. I thought those guys had a outstanding presentation. Next up, something a little different. Hulk Hogan's going to come out to a bigger reaction than anybody else on the show. And at one point they do a bear hug for two minutes and 15 seconds. He and Yokozuna do. And after kicking out of a belly to belly, Hogan does his Superman comeback and finally gets Yokozuna off his feet. It takes three big boots to the face to do it. And unbelievably Yoko kicks out of the leg drop. And they say he's the first person to ever do so. Of course we know. Sid Vicious did the same thing at the 92 WrestleMania. And then Hogan punches Mr. Fuji. And then this mysterious photographer who's wearing a fake wig and a fake beard jumps on the apron and flashes fire in Hogan's eyes. Yokozuna gets the pin with a leg drop. And after the match, Yokozuna gives Hogan the bonsai drop. And Hogan has to be helped out. It gets a star and a half. This is really as strong as you can put over anybody in a Hulk Hogan match. Yes. There's a little bit of shenanigans with the flame, but still the leg drop, the bonsai drop, we're getting helped out of there. Listen, Hogan's doing some business here. What'd you think? I thought it was a great moment for Harvey Whippleman. Yeah, for sure. He got, he was involved in the changing of the guard there. Uh, look. At the end, end of the day, Conrad, the goal was to get the belt off of Hogan. That was, that was the mission. <clears throat> was it artistically done? Eh, uh, it should have been something else. Yeah. It should have been something else. It should have been a, you know, a karate chop to the throat or something or salt in the eyes. And then the leg drop, uh, you know, you got to make everybody happy as if anybody's going to remember or give a shit today. That's just the boys being the boys and protecting their massive and fragile egos. You, uh, do you know anything about this other proposed finish? It's written in the observer that this wasn't the original plan that Hogan actually wanted uh, his Hattori to be the referee. Who's a famous referee over in Japan. Right. 
the idea being he would come in and be this evil referee and screw him. And then I guess about a week out, Hattori receives word that they aren't bringing him in. So instead they try to do this whole cameraman thing instead. Do you remember there being discussion of a, an evil? Yeah. We saw that before with the whole twin thing and Andre back in the yeah. day, but an, a, an evil Japanese referee screwing him out of the title. I vaguely remember that Connie. Yeah. I, yeah. It was uh, an idea that lifted, floated around. I mean, it didn't, it wasn't illogical. Right. Uh, but, uh, it, never, it didn't, it didn't pass the, pass the test. Somebody had, a, somebody had a better idea in their mind. Right. And, and Vince just made it like the ha ha, as he says, Pat Patterson's words. Meltzer would say the storyline that Hogan had proposed and whether this is how it will go or not, I don't know, was that he would lose to set up becoming a six time champion at SummerSlam by how strongly he put Yokozuna over. I have to believe that in his mind for the SummerSlam finish, uh, that he's going to win it back. If he wasn't going to regain the title, he would have dominated the body of the match before losing rather than give Yoko virtually the entire match. So this almost feels like. As a friend of mine likes to say in wrestling, it always comes down to cash and creative. Yep. Maybe Hogan didn't like the payoff for this. Maybe he didn't like any of his payoffs in this era. Maybe he didn't like the WrestleMania payoff and then Look, then things. leave. Yeah. And he God did. Damn it. Ain't that complicated, right? If you're not happy where you are, be a pro and work your way out. And you know, we can't do that. We gotta make sure everybody's feelings aren't hurt. To which I say bullshit. Let's talk about the positioning of this match on the card. Normally a Hulk Hogan match and then your world title match, it goes on last. Maybe that's a little bit of a difference here because we're asking guys to wrestle multiple times because of the tournament format. But when you have your perennial baby face champion, really the, the face of your organization lose the world title in a way that most people wouldn't expect right in the middle of the show. Does that kill the energy in the room or no, I don't think so. Okay. It would have, if Hogan had been, uh, Uber over, I got you. And the angle was Uber hot, but it wasn't. So I don't think so. I don't think it would. I can see it being, a, a, a causing a distraction and not real compatible creatively, but, uh, it, the title, we'd let the title cool off title. Didn't mean a lot. And that's not good. Rick and Scott Steiner are going to be out next, uh, teaming with the smoking guns to beat the head shrinkers and money Inc. Uh, go only go six minutes and 49 seconds when Billy Gunn uh, pins DiBiase. Um, it kind of is what it is. I mean, Scott Steiner's only in briefly. Rick was never in next up. We got Sean Michaels. Retaining the IC title, pinning Crush in 11 minutes and 14 seconds. Meltzer would say Crush has improved and that he can do good moves and has agility, but he just doesn't work well with others. He's going to have a problem in that he's so much larger than almost all the wrestlers, especially with everyone off the juice. In this match, it was hard because they'd go down to the cliche big man, little man spots in the previous three cards or three bouts on the card. And they gave Kevin Nash the name Diesel in a pre match interview. Uh, so this is a big deal. It's Diesel's that was, paper. That was Shane McMahon's you. idea, by the way. Calling him Diesel? Yeah. I like that. Yeah, it's good. Uh, star and a half is the rating here. Sean retains. You know, Sean is uh, not the, the super worker he would go on to be, but he's on the way there. And this storyline with him and Diesel, we know, is going to have a lot of legs to it. Next up, we got Bret Hart pinning Bam Bam Bigelow in 18 minutes and 11 seconds. Uh, this is a, a very good match. Uh, three and three quarter stars, but think about that. He just had this long match with razor, then a long match with Mr. Perfect. Now a long match with bam, bam. As far as the in ring stuff goes, that's about as good as it can get bam, bam against three great guys who can wrestle. And we're still a few weeks away, at least from the Lex express starting. So I guess with Hogan on his way out, Brett's going to be the top guy. And then after the match, they present Brett with a King's robe and crown. And wouldn't you know it, it just fit him perfectly. And then <laughs> Jerry Lawler comes out and destroys Brett with the scepter, smashes the crown, turns the throne over, and the show goes off the air. 
I mean, this is, uh, there's been Kings in the WWF for a while. There was King Harley race and King Haku and King Duggan, but Jerry, the King Lawler, this has always been his gimmick. And All right. we're ending a pay-per-view with a, a happy moment. Our, our, our baby face, former world champion. He's done it. Even though he was injured, he powered through and damn it. This heel had to cut him off. You got to be thrilled for your buddy, Jerry Lawler. I mean, he has been the King of the territories for so long down in Memphis. And now he's in a prime time angle with arguably the top baby face in the whole country. This is a cool deal for your pal, huh? What excited me was the fact that I knew that when the Brett and Lawler eventually had their matches, that'd be great. Yeah. They'd tell a great story. They both are cut from the same cloth. They both had basically the same, uh, philosophy of wrestling, connecting the proverbial dots. So, uh, uh, that's what I was looking forward to the payoff of the angle. So it went off the air with heat, not happiness. And that's not used all the times. Seldom will use it as a matter of fact. So, uh, but I knew that the matches would be money. No doubt about it. The observer would say, my feeling is the announcing wasn't bad, but it was below the standard of most recent pay-per-view shows. Jim Ross was okay, but below his usual standard. I can't find any fault with his performance. Although the interplay between the three wasn't as smooth as at WrestleMania. Heenan was below par as well. He told a few jokes, most of which were predictable, but wasn't anywhere nearly as funny as he usually is. And the chemistry with Randy Savage just doesn't work on this show. It always seemed ill a little at ease every time he try to get in saying something i don't know what else are saying there savage also suffers from this pattern of being too simple and too predictable and without enough varying points to not get stale in a two and a half hour broadcast then when he did it always seems like he really didn't know what he wanted to say and he just wanted to talk but he didn't really have a point to make a three-man booth is challenging you've talked about that before that's when you've got two like proficient broadcasters like yourself and Bobby Heenan, but was Bobby, I mean, was, or were you guys always going to try to square peg round hole? Is that the way it felt with Randy Savage as the third man? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, right. You know, <clears throat> the old, the old expression that he doesn't play well with others certainly is applicable to Randy Savage. Yes. Uh, he just, he was always looking over his shoulder. You know, what do you mean by that? Or what you, you know, I've had him ask after a show say, what did you mean by that? I explained to him and, oh, okay. Like, I don't know if I should believe you or not. Well, so I should have said, Randy, I don't give a fuck if you believe me or not. It don't matter. I'm doing my job. If you don't want to work with me, tell Vince. I'm sure he'll, t- he'll take care of your issue. It's just bullshit. Egos, egos, God almighty, out of control. Let's, uh, Let's get your feedback though. Do you remember getting any feedback from Vince about your performance after the show? Uh, and, and what was the feedback you remember being about the show as a whole Hogan dropping it, Brett's made man, all that stuff. We got through it and, uh, it, we did what we needed to do for Brett, which was a big goal. Again, the Hogan thing is kind of fading into a distant memory, uh, because it was, it was time to make a change time to switch our focus, uh, from the monster baby faces to the wrestling baby faces like Brett. So, you know, I, I, uh, I think the overall feeling was that it was a, a solid as hell show. Thanks to Brett. I said, first thing I said, when we started the show today, he's just, uh, he made that show what it was. If you like tournaments, then you're going to love this pay-per-view. If you like quality matches that have time de- devoted to them, then you're going to like this pay-per-view and all because of the amazing performance of Bret Hart. Go out of your way to see it. It's a, it's a hell of a show, specifically Brett's match with Mr. Perfect. Next week, we're going to be taking a look at a different show that I enjoyed clash of the champions. Number two, the second ever clash of the champions It's called Miami mayhem. The show will feature Arn and Tully defending the NWA tag team titles against Dusty Rhodes and Sting. The Fantastics will take on the Sheep Herders. The Garvins will take on the Varsity Club. And Lex Luger will finally feel the wrath of the Horsemen 
that's all coming your way next week here on grilling JR. But if you're looking for a little more JR, can I recommend adfreeshows.com? We've got a lot of his old WSB radio shows. We've got dozens of interviews with legends like Rick Rude, Jesse Ventura, and Larry Zabrisco, all available for you now over at adfreeshows.com. By the way, if you're business targets men that are 25 to 54 years old, no better place to advertise than right here. Check out how affordable it can be over at advertisewithjr.com. Love to have your social interaction as well. We're on Twitter and Instagram at JR Grilling. We're Grilling JR over on Facebook. And you can keep up with uh, Jim on Twitter at JR's BBQ or on Instagram at Jim Ross BBQ. Of course, uh, we'd love to have you check out some of our fantastic new swag. Got something for everybody available now at grillingjrts.com. But the easiest and best way to promote and support the show is by subscribing to our YouTube channel. It's grillingjr on youtube.com. That's grillingjr on youtube.com. But Jim, it's grilling season and I got a new grill. I did. Uh, I, did. I, I fired it up for the first time this past weekend. I uh, had the family over for a big Memorial day barbecue, had the hot dogs and the hamburgers and the sausages and the whole deal. And you know, before I slid it on the grill, they all oh. got a little all purpose seasoning. Come on now. jrsbbq.com has got something for everybody. Yeah. You know, I got a lot of feedback, uh, while I was in Vegas from different fans that have become hooked on JR's red ass, the hot sauce. And this guy's is developing his own following. Shall we say, uh, maybe we need to create a fan club, but nonetheless, uh, that red ass hot sauce is really tasty. And, uh, father's days around the corner, Connie. I, I think, I think our products make great gifts. And I, I know they do. Yeah. Give us a shot and uh, go on to the look. Don't cost them to look. And, uh, I guarantee you the, the fathers, or the brothers, the cousins, the friends that receive this stuff are going to dance at your wedding because it's really good. And they're going to be happy that they invested in some damn good food. Check it out. JRsbbq.com, something for everybody. And you're right. You can go ahead and order it right now and it'll make it in time for father's day. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, father's day is just one day after the new AEW collision show that's happening next weekend. So place your orders now, get that grill fired up in time for collision and, uh, make dad something nice on father's yeah. day. JRSBBQ.com can take no more socks, no more ties. None of that sauce, sauce it, baby. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Sauce it, baby. We'll be back next week. Talking about all things clash of the champions too, right here. On Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Thanks, everybody, for your support. We're grateful. We're, we're proud to be uh, able to talk to you every week. And I uh, hope you'll join us again next week. That'll be a fun show. And don't forget that jrsbbq.com never closes. We're always open. And the orders go out in 24 hours or less. So thanks for your help and your support. We appreciate you. So long, everybody. Bye-bye. Fight Plus is the ultimate digital platform for live sports and entertainment, and they're now offering a free seven-day trial at TryFight.com. Fight Plus is packed with a premium live event schedule, over a 1,000 hours of live action every year, and a library of more than 4,000 hours on demand, plus exclusive content you can't get anywhere else. Fight is a great partner of ours. They support us, so let's support them. Give that free seven-day trial a shot, and you'll be a member for life. That's tryfight.com. T R Y F I T E dot com. Hey guys, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Need to call a timeout real quick here. I wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my world listeners for a while now. It's about all the incredible things happening over on adfreeshows.com. On a bonus episode of Arn, the Enforcer watches back Beach Blast 92 with the ultimate heel and baby face in Rick Rude and Ricky Steamboat. Draw me a baby face, something that everybody could get behind, kids, women, old folks, young folks, men, you know, all guys wanted to be him. Women, I'm sure, wanted to be with him. Uh, he was the all around package. On volume 55 of the Ask Conrad series, Conrad talks about some of his dream podcast partners, including a couple of degenerates. 
you know, from inside the business and taking over and NXT and all that. I don't think you could get a better podcast partner than triple H there just because he's done so much. However, if you're talking about wanting to learn more about the psychology of wrestling and what makes a match and how to develop talent and all that, could you beat Shawn Michaels? Hey, that's just a small taste of what ad free shows has waiting for you, including a brand new perk, getting to join in on the live recordings of the shows with four levels to choose from. See for yourself why ad free shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. That's right. Sign up today at adfreeshows.com. 